Yeah, so I was studying and studying and studying, and my brain was back to front. And my brain's like, you chose weed. I'm sorry. You only (laughs) get studying or weed. You can't have both. And you already chose weed. I'm doing my best here. And I was like, I understand. I'm not mad at you, brain. I just (laughs) put the quizzes in two days, and I can't, you know, it's my mental illness. I have to, you know, perfection is the goal. Excellence will be tolerated. I can't, you know, not try and study for the thing. And brain's like, well... I mean, you really need to examine your choices. And I was like, I thank you. I know that I need to. But like right now, can you just find a way? He said, no, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't do it. One, two, three, four. If you can do all your stuff. What can figure it out? That's how it chooses you. Welcome to It Chooses You where we delve into what brings us joy and what that says about us. Warning, this episode contains spoilers for David Copperfield, Nicholas Nickleby, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Critical Role. Um, Teresa. Yes, Claire. I am here to talk to you about something I love that I think is, at least to me, unexpected. Unexpected that you love it? Yeah. Okay. It's called Critical Role. Okay, I've heard of Critical (laughs) Role. I can't wait to have you tell me about it. It is a streamed Dungeons & Dragons game. Okay. Played by voice actors. Do you hear their voices or do you see them? Both. Okay. So it's a show you can watch it on YouTube. Okay. Or if you're super hip nerd, you Mm -hmm. can watch it on Twitch TV. I'm not. I have no idea what that is. Okay. Uh, It comes out every Thursday. Okay. It's once a week. Each episode is... Four hours plus. Yeah. Like minimum four hours. They're, they're playing a game. They're yeah. like doing it up. They describe it as a show where some nerdy ass voice actors play Dungeons and Dragons. Right on. That's their that's a quote. I love it so much. Okay. Are you are you into Dungeons playing Dungeons and Dragons yourself? Well, I was hoping you would ask that question. <laughs> I am not into okay. Dungeons and Dragons. Neither am I. I. I appreciate that people are. Nor am I the type of person. That likes to watch other people play games. I am not, was not that kid that would watch other people play video games. Fuck that. Right. I do not like watching other people play board games. Right. With the exception, I feel like this was the gateway, so this is probably linked, to uh, Will Wheaton's Tabletop. Okay. Which is a YouTube show. Okay. In which he and pretty much C-list celebrities. Sure. Play. I mean, no offense games. to Will Wheaton, no, but like Will Wheaton. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> and Will Wheaton's amazing. That was sort of a, a gateway. Also playing tabletop games with my friends like you, yeah. and my cousin Amanda is the one who introduced me to Critical Role, and she was bugging me over and over again. You've got to watch this show. You've got it's Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, I don't care about Dungeons and Dragons. Right. So my history with Dungeons and Dragons is the cartoon from the eighties. They had a Saturday morning cartoon oh. called Dungeons and Dragons, okay. which I loved. Oh, okay. I didn't know about the game. All it was was an animated show where these characters, there was a like elf and a wizard and all these different they play they went through adventures. Okay. But they sort of framed it as they were kids who ended up in this other world okay. of magic. And, sure. And like like in the eighties we all wanted to fall into the magical exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah, because everyone who grew up reading, you know, Lion the Witch and the Wardrobe mm-hmm. was like, Where's the back of my goddamn wardrobe? Exactly. Yeah. So that was a show. I watched that show, but I didn't know it was a game and any I don't think there was anything really related to the game, necessarily. I remember the series ending really abruptly. Mm-hmm. So I was really into the adventure piece of it. I wouldn't consider myself a nerd culture connoisseur, necessarily. Sure. I feel like the last few years I've started to be. So I um, <laughs> I also played Dungeons & Dragons once in college mm. with some kind of friends, acquaintances, and they wouldn't tell me what it was. I was like, no, but I had heard of it, but I was like, no, but like, what happens right. in the game? Like, what do you do? And they were like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I do not remember that game. <laughs> I never played again, so I didn't enjoy myself. <laughs> was, but I love that they're all mysterious, like, don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, just, just don't come. Don't worry no. about it. Just come. You're going to like it. We played it on a bus in Italy. That's what I remember, which okay. is a weird detail. Okay. We were studying over there, and they were like, When we get on the bus, we're going to play Dungeons and Dragons. I don't remember even rolling dice. I may have not even lasted five minutes. (laughs) 
I think I was like. <laughs> you say you played a game of Dungeons yeah, and Dragons. I don't think I did. What you mean was you were invited to play, <laughs> yeah. and then you just sat in a seat a couple seats away and listened with I, one ear. I think they probably started to take me through building the character, and I was like, nah, bro. No, this is where I dip out, yeah. too. I'm like, what? It takes four hours to set up. Yeah. I don't need to invite. Can't you just tell me who I am? Maybe? Yeah, exactly. No, so no. maybe this is why I like watching it. Mm. <laughs> And now, watching Critical Role, I feel like I can never play Dungeons and Dragons because the group is it, it. With my limited knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons, I can tell that this is a spectacularly special group of people. The Critical Role people. Yes. Okay. The group of people that are playing are such. First of all, they they're all in LA because they're all voice actors. Sure. They are. The diamonds in the rough. Probably the only eight good people in LA. <laughs> I assume. <laughs> no, That's I'm a bold sure. Statement. I'm sure there's lots of good people in LA, but they talk a lot about how they found each other, yeah. and it wasn't that wasn't easy. <laughs> well, so, I imagine the group you play with is like really important to how fun it is. It's super important because I mean I don't know that much about it. You know, my partner Mike Hello uh, <laughs> is also into it, and he plays regularly, mm-hmm. several times a week, and he's always invited me to come. I'm always like, nah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 thanks. Well, and I think it helps that they're actors as right. well. So they're familiar with story. They're not unused to improvising and they've built really incredible characters mm-hmm. that are super compelling. There is frustration on occasion mm. about what's happening. And there is a meta sense that you see their reactions to each other playing. So there's the character and then there's the actor, right? So the characters may do something and it's really fun to see the actors who are maybe watching someone have a conversation react so they might laugh or... And that is, is, is a different layer that's really fun to watch. So the thing about Critical Role is they've gotten a lot of press lately because they broke a record for the highest funded film or television project on Kickstarter Mm. recently. So they started a Kickstarter to turn their adventures into an animated series, which as you watch is kind of the one desire you have is to see it polished and see it as an animated. There's just something because they're voice actors, they create these really incredible characters and they use their voices so beautifully. It's there. Mm -hmm. It's in the ethos. And so they decided to start this Kickstarter and it, it was months ago, but they they raised in four days, the first four days of the campaign, they raised five point nine four million dollars. <laughs> At this point right now, it's February thirteenth as we record this, two thousand twenty. It's Galentine's Day. <laughs> it's Galen- <laughs> it is and we're recording. That's good. They've had eighty eight thousand backers pledge eleven million three hundred and eighty five thousand four hundred and forty nine dollars. Okay. So the people who, they're very good at whatever the fuck this is. Yes. Okay. Oh, so the, yes. This is part of why I'm saying this is people care. So that right. must mean something. Right. right. I'm not a freak, damn it. <laughs> they also just brokered a deal with Amazon. Amazon's agreed to produce the animated series. So okay. it's now becoming a thing. a thing. I think they signed up. I believe, don't quote me on this, they've signed up for two seasons. So what was supposed to be, I think, one episode <laughs> of an animated series has now turned into this huge thing. And I'm sure that there's probably part of them that's like, Mm. Now we got to do this other thing. But they have to keep up the Dungeons and Dragons stream, too. Yeah. So they're just incredibly successful, and I'm so proud of them. Because I feel like they're my friends. Right. So having said that, I should probably talk to you about who's on the show. Please do. <laughs> I should also say this. I, I, don't, I haven't watched other shows. Other kinds of like this. Like this. Critical Role started as a private game of Dungeons and Dragons. So what happened is one of the participants, one of the actors, Liam O'Brien, used to play when he was a kid and hadn't played in years. He's now a grown adult. And he asked a few of his buddies for his birthday to play a game of Dungeons and Dragons. They enjoyed it so much that they kept playing. So this was a home game for, I think, years before they started to do the live stream. So it was already a group of people that had found each other and were really enjoying each other's company. And had history. Exactly. Yeah, in jokes. Most of them were... are. I think all of them were in the voiceover industry, so they kind of knew each other. There's different threads. They eventually began to stream it, and it's just, over time, it's been going for years, but over time, it's just become incredibly popular. Okay. Is it all white dudes? Everyone is white. It's not all white dudes. And I I was thinking about this today, and we'll talk about the inclusivity of the show, but one thing they do is when they have guests is when, when they really bring in a more inclusive group of people. And I've really enjoyed that. I've discovered some really cool voice actors. 
that I didn't know about that were African American or Latina. So that's been really cool too. The players are Matthew Mercer is the dungeon master. Marisha Ray in I'm gonna talk a little bit about most focus on the second campaign, which I'll distinguish in a moment. But Marisha Ray, her character in the second campaign is Beauregard. She's a human monk. She's a badass. There's Sam Regal, who plays Not, and he's a goblin rogue. Interesting side note, Sam Regal played Gavrash in the touring production of Les Mis. Okay. I'm 99% sure I saw him play that role <laughs> in Texas growing up. Was he, did he look as young as Gavrash is, or was it some kind? He was very was he young. Baby? No, baby he was touring? very young. Okay. He was maybe 12, so oh, yeah. maybe a little older, but he, so he plays not a goblin rogue. Laura Bailey plays Jester. She's a tiefling cleric. Tiefling is a race. Okay. It's sort of, I don't really, again, don't know much about Dungeons and Dragons, but she has horns. They always have really interesting colored skin, so hers is blue. Then there's Taliesin Jaffe, who was in Mr. Mom as a kid. He was a child actor. Was he the little toe-headed one? I don't remember. Okay. I think so. Okay. But he was a child actor who's since got into voiceover work. And he's like, the blank, the blanky, the guy who's like, I need to, I just need to be alone. For a minute. I think he might be, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. But he plays Molly Mock, who's a tiefling blood hunter. So same race as Laura's character. There's Travis Willingham, who's from Texas. He plays Ford. He's a half-orc warlock. And then Liam O'Brien plays Caleb, who's a human wizard. And then Ashley Johnson plays Yasha. Yasha is a barbarian. Her race is considered fallen Asimar, which is like a fallen angel. So like a divine race, but they've fallen. I don't know exactly what that means. They're darker characters. Okay. And they're, she's quite human. So in Dungeons and Dragons, there's your race and there's your class. Mm -hmm. So you have, your race could be goblin, could be human, could be orc, things like that. And then, and then your class is your set of skills and that could be warlock or rogue is really fun, paladin, things like that. So there's two campaigns. The first campaign they did, which was the characters they started with in the home games, finished out at 115 episodes live. Okay. But they were playing before that. So when I recommend this to people, I recommend they start with campaign two. It's much more streamlined and polished. And it's right now, it's hit as of this recording, it's 94 episodes. So it's a little more manageable, but they're creeping up on that 115. Mm-hmm. So... It's it's are, a lot of content. Are <laughs> I don't episodes want to like do the an math. hour? No, three to four hours. There's, you said no four hours plus. So it is a lot of content. But this becomes one of the best things about it. Okay. Because in our era of streaming, I am generally not a quantity person, but there is something about the quantity of the content. It's also quality content, but there is something about having that much to work your way through and that level of epic that is really satisfying. I mean, it is that Lord of the Rings mm. thing or that. Game of Thrones thing where it's just it's so huge and there's just so many pieces that it's really fascinating to have that much. Yeah. So there is something about that in itself that's really cool. I started with campaign two because that was recommended to me. And then once I had caught up to the live shows, I went back and watched campaign one. And that's really how I'd recommend anyone who's interested in picking up do that. Start with episode one of campaign two. Okay. So a campaign is A totally different set of characters. Everything is set in the same world called Exandria, but the two campaigns are set on different continents to begin with. So it's a completely different set of characters and circumstances. Do they make up the world or does the world is like a prepackaged one that you can choose? That's a good question. I believe that this is a world that Matthew Mercer has designed and they work very closely with... And he's the DM? Yes. yes. He's incredible. Who has a memory? DM That's right. Stands for Dungeon Master, guys. I can't believe I'm talking about this. It's so amazing. <laughs> he, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe he has created the world. That's okay. what I was told at some point. It's set at a different time as well. So the second campaign is set a little bit in the future from the first. Mm-hmm. So every once in a while, there will be a little Easter egg connected to the first one. I'm just going to go ahead and say, because I don't want you to have to say spoiler alert 17,000 times. If you like Critical Role and you don't know what's going to happen and you don't want to know, don't listen to this one. Yeah. Pick so another if, one. If you haven't gotten through Campaign 2, Episode 94, which <laughs> I don't just, have the title of. I'm just doing some math. Like, it's 100 episodes each, don't, roughly. <laughs> don't even tell me. Four hours, like 800 hours of your life. Okay. That's love. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Just to distinguish between Campaign 1 and 2, they are playing the opposite characters of 
who they played in the first campaign. So everyone chose to go in a complete counter direction, mm -hmm. which of course they did, of right? Course. It's it's so fantastic. After 800 hours mm -hmm. playing a certain kind of person. Campaign one is a bunch of heroes that are assholes. Sure. Campaign two is a bunch of assholes that are heroes. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a real fondness for campaign two. It was hard for me to go to the first one after seeing campaign two and being so attached to those characters. I did fall in love with campaign one as well. It, it is charming and lovely, just as lovely. But I do have, I, I love the group of characters in campaign two because I love assholes that are heroes. So what do I mean by that? In campaign one, because the stream picks up after they've played for a couple of years, the group is already well known. And they're a lot, by and large, not all of the characters, but most of them are from these really privileged backgrounds. And they're a little more the idea of what you would want to play on first blush with sure. Dungeons and Dragons. Sure. So three of the six characters are elves. Sure. Or half elves, things like that. Of course. So there's a twin set of twins. You know, everybody wants to have superpowers. Exactly. And yeah. and whatever. But there's yeah, a yeah. set of twins. They're basically elven royalty almost. Sure. Or high up in the elven world. Weird relationship with their dad, which is really cool. <laughs> but they're twins. One is a paladin. One is a ranger. Elf ranger. I mean, elf ranger. Come on. That's like the first thing you want. I don't know. Another character is like a, an elven basically born into the leadership of this elven community of like wind fairies. Okay. They're called they're called the Ashari. Sure. They're what you typically think of as heroes, but they're kind of dicks. Like every once in a while they really surprise you with a super selfish move. Mm. So famously, spoiler alert, y'all, Laura Bailey's character in that first campaign, Vex, she It's a great name. Yeah. Vexalia is her full name. Her brother's Vax. It gets confusing. <laughs> Vex, famously, they had a, a guest star on, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but he's the guy from The Nerdist. He played a character named Blurn, who's like part dragon, like little dragon dude. He had this really cool broom and that he, literally he could fly on. And at some point in the game that he was on for one episode, she fucking stole his broom, that character stole his broom and kept it and had it the rest of the campaign. Here she is this like, she's this elven ranger. She's this hero. She has everything she could want, but she sees this thing and she wants to take it. But that's human, right? Like, you know. So, so he's lost, he's lost the magic broom. He playing a game with this group of people. Does he then have to not have it when he plays again? Or does I he just never play that could, character again? He could probably decide. I'm not sure if that character was invented. There are people who've brought characters in mm -hmm. from other campaigns. I don't know in his case. If I, you, I think that would playing. be up to the person. If you were real a real hardcore, I think you'd you'd not have that broom now. But it, I think it would be up to your own discretion as a player. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. I I imagine that broom. Yeah. I have that broom. Sure, so, you can have one too. Yeah, but no, no. <laughs> Next time no, that's I play, why I have this. Yeah, broom. exactly. That's what <laughs> yeah. I do. It's fantasy, right? That's yeah. just one example of a hero who's a dick. First and foremost, hero. That's what I project into the world. But then doing these surprising. And in, from a story perspective, interesting things. I'm really hung up on that broom. I'm just imagining <laughs> no, a cute little dragon was, baby getting something stolen. I believe it was called Broomgate. <laughs> well, I understand why people are, were up in arms because <laughs> I don't pissed. know. I don't know anything about any of this, and, and I'm like it's really hung up on that broom. Okay. <laughs> now the thing I'll say is she had to roll for all that to pull that off. So the dice are this element of chaos in there. She might have screwed it up. He might have seen what she was up to. You know, campaign two, as I said, is a bunch of assholes that are heroes. So the thing about them is they're really underdogs, and all of their characters, most of their characters, come from really underdog background, just in terms of their their race and their class. And we have a goblin rogue. One of the characters is an orphan. One of them is a wizard hiding from his pretty sketchy, dangerous past. Nobody knows who they are. They're reckless and they're really silly and they can be really rude. They're socially awkward. They're pretty brazen when they encounter other characters. There is a naive boldness to them, but since it's grounded in who they are as characters, it's relatable. It's never out of the blue. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why that person would do that. It's, it's never like that. And the other cool thing about campaign two is you see the group form from the beginning. So in episode one, they all meet for the first time. The, the group as a whole meets. There are a couple of characters that were already hanging out. There are a group of misfits and a group of assholes and selfish people. But what you watch is you see their better natures emerge. Mm. When you play Dungeons and Dragons, you have your characters, the Dungeon Master presents you with a series of scenarios. And so these 
actors are improvising. Just in case people didn't know that. But it's not like watching bad live improv. <laughs> oh, they're they're talented. Yeah, 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 yeah. they are. Yeah. I'm not saying Because everything... otherwise it's like you're playing around a table. It's like, is another deus ex Kevin? Like, right. Oh, you, you can fly now? Great, great. I'm Okay, you can fly awesome. now. Awesome. <laughs> but it, I, it, there, I'm not saying every moment works perfectly or that it... If it were to become something like an animated series, you would definitely do some editing. But it it has this element always at, at the base of like the truth of these characters, which is really fantastic. I think that's where all good writing emerges from. There are moments where the in Critical Role where the characters and the actors are in conflict, mm. where the actors don't want them to do something. Mm. There there are moments where if you're being true to the character, you're making like bad human decisions. <laughs> I think people, most people play to go into battle. Like they're looking forward to the battle. Which is the dice rolling part. Yeah, you roll dice throughout for anything you try to do. Oh, okay. Um, or, for example, you roll for persuasion. So if I were going to try, if I were trying to talk my way out of a situation, mm -hmm. you you roll for persuasion. But, but and then what, you have your you, stats. But you roll it in response to a conflict of some kind. Exactly. Or like, a, okay, an interaction. Exactly. Yeah, okay. But I, I would think a lot of people get really excited just about the, the fight part. Sure. And I would, th I, again, this is a guess, but I, my instinct is that a lot of, Dungeons and Dragons games focus on the battle mm. piece of it. But this is what I love about Critical Role is that is not it at all. So there's a big emphasis on character development and relationships and the arc of the characters. Okay. Everyone's looking for something. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a story of where they came from and where and where they want to go. So it's interesting to see in the relationship of the group, which is basically this adventuring party, how those things develop. So they spend a good amount of time talking, talking to each other, figuring things out. Again, my instinct is that's what's really unique about this show as opposed to another <laughs> and your garden variety Dungeons and Dragons show. Uh, when they're introducing, talking things over and introducing each other to things, is it like, I'm a this and I believe this, or do they actually just let it no, unfold the way relationships the unfold? Okay, exactly. great, great, great. great. Oh, that makes just me like we are. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Yes. I was really, I was. Mm, yeah. There are moments where they say, "I walk over to the da da da," but it is cross to fireplace. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's like three percent of the time. Usually, when they say it, it's in character voice, so it's it's as though the character's telling you what's happening. It's not okay. If that makes sense. I like that better. I would say it's seventy percent of them relating to each other and to other people. Cool. And then like thirty percent fighting. <laughs> <laughs> fighting. Fighting. Battles, not fighting each other. Oh, they fight too. That's true. They do fight a lot. <laughs> when there's brooms to be stolen. The thing is that the story has stakes because the characters are the driving force in there. The story itself has stakes. Right. And if you like them, you care about what happens to them. Exactly. Yeah. And it has stakes for the characters and for the actors. So it's not this pure escapism into like some battle world. This show has made me cry. Deeply, deeply cry at conflicts and... Crises of conscience, you know. Oh. Yeah, there are some things that that unfold that are so deeply beautiful and like what? And that well, <laughs> so huge spoiler alert. She's almost crying now. Yeah, no, it's she's true. almost <laughs> crying remembering that. She yeah, died. huge spoiler alert. There is a character in the first campaign, Maxwell Dan, the brother, the elven brother, who's a paladin, becomes a paladin of the Raven Queen, who's the goddess of death. He in their last battle with a huge, the ultimate evil, Okay. who's trying to become a god. That all checks out. Yeah. They go into battle with him unprepared and not knowing quite what was going on. He's killed. So this is the thing is, your characters can die. There's a whole process of what happens in battle, but your character can die. His character is killed in that next to last battle with the super, super evil guy. Part of what they were doing to try and, and save the world from this evil was they started communing with the gods. So they had basically had to go find all the gods and ask them for help. Vaxeldon asks the Raven Queen to send him back to finish the battle. And she says, I will send you back. But when this battle is done, you will come back to me. He's around for a bit more. They finish that final battle. And there's a moment that he, the dungeon master allowed him to have some time to say goodbye. But the same day. He is taken back. And the campaign ends shortly after that, but there's these summary pieces. One character is in love with him. The other one is his sister. And they're all deeply close friends and co-adventurers. So there's this 
really deep sadness. And, and then he comes back knowing what's going to happen. As they recount what the characters do for the rest of their lives, a big piece of this is trying to see him again. Mm. That's frustrating. So it's... Actively crying now. Yeah, actively, actively crying, crying, talking crying about this. Well, that's really wonderful. I mean, it's it sounds like it's just a really good book. But yeah. It's just, it, it took you 400 <laughs> hours to read. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that's the, the depth I want people to understand is it's very... It's very literary. I'll tell another anecdote. There's a, an episode in the second campaign where they have come to the coast. The group in the second campaign is called the Mighty Nine, but it's N-E-I-N, like nine. Okay. <laughs> and there's not nine of them. The Mighty Nine goes to the coast, and they're trying to intercept someone who they need information from, and they hear that he'll be at the docks at midnight. Well, they basically end up interrupting some sort of exchange. It gives the impression of like a drug deal. Sure. It's actually a religious artifact kind of thing. They come unbeknownst. They're basically dealing with pirates is what's going on. They come upon it, this exchange. They cock it up so bad that there's a, a moment of a fake suicide. They set the ship on fire. And the next thing they know, they don't know what else to do. They get in so deep. <laughs> That they just lift anchor. <laughs> no one knows how to... St- like, there's one character that has some sea experience. They just lift anchor and go. And <laughs> and panics. And everybody... No one has a choice. They leave one character behind, though. Let's <laughs> just swim. And, like, catch up with them. But the whole next episode, after that, the characters were having these conversations. It wasn't the whole episode, but they were on this ship. And they were like what are we doing? <laughs> Why did we do that? We killed someone. They killed someone. They, you know, it was, and that's what I love about it is the mess they get into, yeah. the mistakes they make, and they're just, you have to go with it at a certain point. I believe that anything we're really obsessed with or interested in is obviously giving us something, right? Sure. This show gives me a lot, but what I I really love about it is the the mistakes they make. Yeah. The characters make, not necessarily the actors. There's there's something... I'm sorry, I'm, sorry I'm interrupting you, yeah, but no. there's something about the making of mistakes in a public forum that is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Because, like, of course, everybody makes mistakes all the time, but so far, the history of the world has mostly tended to favor pretending you don't, mm-hmm. or hiding when you do, or hoping nobody saw. Um, yes, I like uh, I like a little public... Uh, vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. The show in general, the campaign too, has naval battles, mysteries, pranks, dungeon crawls, shit talking between characters, wars, secret traps, shenanigans galore, gods trying to take over the world, shopping, heists, shapeshifters, tattoos, pirates, and talking animals. Oh my god. One thing I love about it is that it has that depth of character, but it is very funny. Yeah. And again, it's character-driven humor. So it's all about the dungeon master creates a variety of scenarios. They make their choices as their characters mm-hmm. and they end up in these scenarios. I mean, it's the way to write. Yeah. This is how you write. They prank each other all the time and they're so stupid. And, and I mean that in the most complimentary way. They are so <laughs> stupid. By that, I mean they are so completely and wholly themselves Yeah. that they just make these decisions that we make as humans, but it's just really entertaining to watch. Mm-hmm. I um, will have a third beer. For example. <laughs> exactly. No, 10,000 gold is not too much to spend <laughs> exactly. on a sword. The other really great thing about it socially is the power dynamics of sex in the show. They've created a world, and this is specifically it more in campaign two than in campaign one, though it does start there. They have women in roles of military captains, wardens, sea captains. They have non-gendered characters where they refer to them as they all the female dwarves have beards. They have characters in the wrong body. I don't want to go into specifics there, but the young trans community is really latched onto mm-hmm. that, where it's like, I, this is not my body. I have a different body. I need to be sent back to the other body, please. That's cool. And none of it is commented on right. or treated like an after-school special. It's right, just right, a right. fact of the world. That's right. As it should be. Yes. Yeah. And it's so fantastic. It's really refreshing. As it should be. Because it fucking is. And then I just admire it as a writer. That, you know, there's this really beautiful chaos that emerges. Matthew Mercer says all the time he doesn't know what they're going to do. Did he know they were going to steal the ship? 
no. It, that, in fact, he says it in that episode. I had no idea that's the way that was going to go. You know, <laughs> There's a structure and a plan on the part of the dungeon master, and then that meets the characters. Yeah. The characters, there's something structured about them, too, because they are who they are. But it's interesting to see what happens when the scenario and the character meet each other. I mean, this is just writing. Mm-hmm. If you know you have this type of character and you put that character in this scenario, how are they going to react? There's only so many options. But... The really great thing is this element of chaos with the dice, Mm -hmm. right? Right. So no matter what anyone intends, may or may not happen. Exactly. And sometimes the dice is the most brilliant writer. The (laughs) chaos is the most brilliant writer of the show. There are some glorious moments that occur because of a dice roll. And it, and you see it afterwards and you go, that is the only way that could have gone. That is the best way that could have gone. So, for example, at the end of campaign one, Sam Regal plays a cool bard character who's a real rapscallion, like always into some kind of scrape, very full of himself. And he has, from day one, wanted a gun. So there is a character in campaign one that has, I think it's a class that Matt invented for Taliesin and the guy it's a gunslinger but in the context of this world this character Percy has invented guns okay and that becomes an interesting conversation as well Scanlan Sam Regal's character wants nothing more than a gun they will not give him one because he's irresponsible and you <laughs> this show believes that you do not give guns to irresponsible what? people yeah. It's crazy talk. Old-fashioned gun control. Crazy. So no. There's all kinds of shenanigans where he tries to get his hands on one. Never does. Finally, events unfold at the very end of the campaign where he gets a gun and he gets his hand on one bullet. Right? And it's old-fashioned. You know, you got to load the powder or everything. Mm -hmm. So Tamp, tamp, tamp. Exactly. I think it's in the next to the last episode. He fires the gun. When you look at it from a writing perspective, it's either got to go really well Or really poorly. I was going to ask if he accidentally killed himself. Yeah, no, that would have been great. (laughs) (laughs) For people who don't know, when you roll for skill checks in Dungeons & Dragons, it's a dice that has 20 sides. Natural one, it means you rolled a one. That is really, really bad and usually means you do something like kill yourself. Or a natural 20 is really, really good and you would automatically succeed on that thing. Well, he rolls a natural 20. For whatever thing he's trying to do with the gun. Mm -hmm. And it's glorious. Afterwards, it's the only way it could go. So the the dice understand. They're an element of chaos. Yeah. But they understand. Or like I was saying about this character that died. The dice decided that, Mm -hmm. you know, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But what a beautiful story emerged. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea that beautiful stories emerge from chaos. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, there's also, it's definitely, it's faithful. It's, Mm -hmm. It's a faithful exercise. Because if you're letting chaos determine what you do next or how successful you are or what you want to do, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, love and faith involved in that. Mm-hmm. I don't mean that's Christian true. faith, just so we're clear. That's a I really, just mean faith in general. I think that's a really beautiful way to put that. The community they've built around their show is obviously really incredible. Right. right? They've got 88,000 backers. Yes. But they have done, a, from the beginning done a lot of charity work and promotion of charities with what they do in fundraisers. They have an incredible group of fan artists. And so every episode that plays in the breaks, it's just fan art. And it is so delightful. And it's really interesting to me that there's a commonality of how they look. There's obviously the style of different artists. They have the official, like, what they look like thing. But there, there's just something in it that's a common thread of spirit that when you watch this fan art it unfolds and then through their storytelling and also through their social media presence and like actions in the community they they really create this atmosphere of inclusivity Mm. and they're just freaking good people and they're your your best friends you know and I think the thing I admire about them as artists is they sort of stumbled into this in this beautiful way but they've done it their way and I think that's where we are with certain technology is that you you don't have to be beholden to gatekeepers. Sure. If they had started out by pitching this as an animated right, exactly. series, it wouldn't have the spirit or they wouldn't have found the things, discovered the things they found. Right, because big American business is not a faithful kind exactly. of business. Yeah. It has no faith in, yeah. only in how much money they think it's going to make, <laughs> yeah. mostly. The really cool thing about it is that it is a discovery. Yeah. You're watching them discover things in the best way possible and... 
yeah, it's just a really fun, engrossing story. Mm -hmm. Super long, epic story. (laughs) I keep wanting to talk about Dickens in relation to, like, Mm -hmm. serial storytelling. Even though I have a degree in that, I don't really know. I want to say the words Barnaby Rudge. I don't know why. Well, the thing I know about Dickens, who wrote my favorite book ever, Hmm. David Copperfield, is my favorite novel ever. I start my life at the beginning of my life by recording that I was born. Is that that one? I think so, yeah. yeah. He... What I do know about him... I just know the Monty Python. <laughs> David Copperfield. Yeah. <laughs> I need to watch that. Nickerless Nickleby. <laughs> it's K-N-I-C-K-E-R-L-E-S-S. The thing I know about Charles Dickens is that he would actually sit in his rooms and have conversations with his characters. So he was role-playing on some level. There's another commonality between Dickens and between Critical Role is that I never thought we'd get here. <laughs> There's another commonality between Dickens and the Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> well, I'm glad you watch. know more about it than I do because I introduced the topic <laughs> hoping that you would not gonna you know bounce it up with your tennis racket or something. But I do like to read and experience satire. I like that a lot. But satire is written from this place where the writer is sort of above. It's so knowing. Yeah, it's, it's above so knowing. This, the subject yeah, exactly. matter, which is which is really fun sometimes. Exactly. Yeah, but it's not the same as being there with them. But I think that in order to be a truly great writer, you need to have compassion for all of your characters, even the quote-unquote evil one that really comes out in Critical Role. It's the love of these characters. Yeah. That's all very sweet. Yep. I can see, I feel like you're becoming wistful imagining it. I am. I really it. love it. Yeah. It's just a fantastic show. And if you like fantasy, I just recommend people check it out. It is on YouTube, mm-hmm. usually a little delayed. And then it's also on Twitch TV. Well, that's it sounds cool. You've yeah. mentioned it to me before, and I've always said, eh. but now I'm slightly more enthusiastic. Mm. <laughs> mm. If I start listening to it or watching it, I'm going to want to talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. But I'm like seven years late, It sounds, which is often where I am. <laughs> and I had the experience of watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. three years later than everyone else uh-huh. and had just the worst week when I found out Ward was a Hydra agent, which is like the first thing you learn is that he's actually <laughs> a Hydra agent. And I was like, why did anybody? And like everybody did tell you, Teresa. It's just, you did not pay attention <laughs> when it was coming out. So I'm like, like I get upset. Like, like my emotional twists and turns are not in line with my friends <laughs> because I'm not... Watching the same thing that you're watching. So I'll come to you and be like, what happens after this thing where they do the with the mountain and the whatever? Well, this, you know? this is why my cousin wanted me to watch so badly. was because she wanted someone to talk to about it. Yeah. Which is a big part of watching a thing. It is. Well, thanks for telling me yeah. about that. Oh, God, I said it again. But it's fine. Thanks for telling me about that. <laughs> That's why I love Critical Role. That's why you love Critical Role. <laughs> Thank you for listening to It Chooses You. Your hosts are Teresa Sparks and Claire Patton. Our theme song is by Bobby Dart. If you'd like to get in touch with us, drop us an email at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com.